To call the recent developments in Berserk insane feels like a major understatement, because no words can describe the current situation that the good guys are in. The Eastern Exile Arc started off hopeful by having Guts and his allies finally reach a safe haven where they can regroup and build a strategy to end Griffith's reign of terror. But in classic Berserk fashion, things have gotten worse before they even began to get good, because not only has the Kushan Council to organize humanity's defense been invaded by an apostle, it's also under threat for from a far greater power in the form of the God Hand. Chapter 378 ended with an astral tornado descending upon the Kushan Royal Palace, which is rather reminiscent of the first time we saw a bell lit being activated in the series. That particular incident ended with the destruction of the castle it occurred in, and with the death of the father who summoned it. This time, the death hole will be exponentially higher, and the stakes can't be ignored for the sake of pride. What's coming now is the beginning of the end, and we're here to give you our predictions for the same in this video. So, without further ado, these are Marvelous Anime's major predictions for Berserk Chapter 379, Explained. Delivering justice to the thrill killer, Salat vs. Rakshas will settle their rivalry once and for all. Chapter 378 began with its antagonist being as confused as we the readers, which is a rare thing in Berserk. As we told you in our chapter analysis video, Rakshas died during his encounter with Rickert, Salat, and Daiba in Falconia. Catching a missile to the face tends to do that to a person, no matter how big of a demon they are, and by all rights, Rakshas's life should have returned to the abyss. After all, that's part of the natural life cycle of an apostle. Their souls are linked to hell for eternity, and so long as they manage to stay alive, they can avoid paying that permanent toll. But in the event of their death, nothing can keep them from being dragged into the abyss by the countless tortured souls swirling within that infernal vortex, and Rakshas must have expected the same fate for himself. So his surprise is justified when he realizes that he's been resurrected, because this is the first time such a thing has happened. He's so disoriented by this revelation that a few of Salat's henchmen manage to break his steel claws, but slowly he gets his head back in the game. Rakshas realizes that if he's here, then that means the God Hand isn't done with him, and if he can't kill Griffith, then maybe he can make do with killing the Young Master instead. Rakshas's self-professed goal since before joining Griffith has been to kill him. He's a thrill killer, a man who murders because he likes how it makes him feel, and hunting the Falcon is the ultimate assassination job. Rakshas has been patiently waiting for his opportunity to have a go with the leader, but when he died and came back, he must have realized how naive his thoughts were. Towards the end of the chapter, he mutters to himself, for now, this will do twice, which feels confusing considering he was rambling like a madman a second earlier, but it makes sense when you consider his character motivations from a bird's eye view. His ultimate desire is to kill Griffith, but if that's impossible, he needs to settle for the next best thing, and that's the man who exiled him from the clan. Salat and Rakshas have never gotten along, and judging by the way the young master leapt at the apostle towards the end of chapter 378, he's itching to remove this stain to the Baki Raka clan's reputation once and for all. As much as we'd love to see how Rakshas will approach his falcon hunt, we don't know if he's going to make it out of this fight alive, again. Daiba is right in telling Salat's soldiers to not underestimate Rakshas despite having the numbers advantage, but he's holding back important information himself, so his word doesn't amount to a whole lot right now. The one whom we trust to solve the Rakshas problem is Salat, and though we can't predict the outcome, we can tell you this much. Rakshas versus Salat 2 is probably going to be the last time we see these two fight, because there won't be time to deal with low-level demons like him once she arrives. The Return of the Queen of Evil Slan arrives in the New World this should have been evident to all of us who have been attached to Berserk for a while now, but the fact that Farnese specifies Kliphoff as the domain that's opening up in the Kushan capital can only mean one thing. Slan is coming. When we first encountered the Astral World's Region of Darkness, it felt like a reverse elf helm, but not in the worst sense of the phrase. It was different, populated by creatures of the night who will leave you alone if you leave them alone. But deep within the bowels of Klipoff, when Guts arrived to save Casca and Farnese from rabid trolls and ogres, he was set upon by one of the beings he'd been hunting for two years. Slan. Slan's partial manifestation was a shock and a lesson, because while it came completely out of left field, it also explained what was happening to the world itself. The reason Klipoff emerged in the physical world before the great roar of the astral world is twofold. 
The first is that since Griffith's incarnation, the borders between the two worlds were beginning to merge. This allowed regions like Flora's Spirit Tree and Clipoff to become easily accessible to outsiders, but the second and the bigger reason for Clipoff's emergence was Slan's desire. She wanted to see Guts ever since their first encounter during the Eclipse and then again at the Slug Count's castle. She'd been keeping tabs on him, and when Griffith made it possible for her to force a partial advent, she did it so she could lay hands on her dear boy. Slan is obsessed with Guts and wants to make him one of hers, despite being told that he isn't destined to become an apostle all the way back during the Black Swordsman arc. Now, normally, that kind of thing would dissuade a person from trying something like that again and again, but if Slan has learned anything through her observation of Guts, it's that causality isn't concrete and choices can change if you have a bad enough day. Her first encounter with Guts in Clipoff was all about torturing the guy into joining her because she's a sadomasochist and she desires him. He managed to repel her with Skull Knight's help, but we're not really sure the Wandering Wraith is going to be any help this time around. For starters, we haven't seen him since Elfhelm fell. Moreover, his ace in the hole is responsible for everything that's currently happening, so forgive us for not really trusting his efficacy in God Hand related matters. But the reason we're saying all of this is because when Clipoff first emerged, Slan said something rather intriguing. She called Clipoff her own demonic womb, and she started spawning endless trolls and ogres to try and slow down Skull Knight and keep him away from her fun. She also mentions that each God Hand member has their own preferred Sephira within the astral world, which makes Clipoff her preferred preferred Sephira. God Hand members are intrinsically linked to their respective realms, so if they manifest in the physical world, best believe they're bringing home with them. The Great Roar only made it that much easier, and the fact that the tornado looming above the Kushan Royal Palace looks like an interstice triggered by a behelet can mean only one thing. A God Hand is coming. Be it a ritual to create an apostle or one of their own kinsmen, that astral gate only descends from the skies when the God Hand arrives on Earth to bless one of their own. Slan's connection to Clipoff and obsession with Guts is enough for us to guess that she's the one invading the Kushan capital, but the question remains, why is this happening? It's kinda random for Slan to attack the capital before consulting with Griffith, because we're pretty sure he doesn't even know Rakshas is back. Or maybe he does, and Slan's attack isn't random because it has conveniently caught the top brass of the Kushan Empire in its crosshairs. Putting them in harm's way will further Griffith's agenda whether Slan wants it or not, so now we've got to discover whether she's interjecting of her own volition or on behalf of causality. If it's the former, then it's very likely that she's here for guts and she'll kill everything that stands in her way. But if it's the latter, then finding the source of her emergence is crucial. If it is Betchy the Behelit, which isn't in Guts' possession as far as we're aware, then the good guys need to figure out a way to neutralize it before things get even more out of hand. Maybe this is where Skull Knight can redeem himself for Elfhelm by swallowing the source of Slan's manifestation and making amends. But the series seems to suggest that she's manifesting herself through Rockshoss's body, which is just as disturbing as it is cool and convenient. She doesn't have to use troll guts to create an ethereal form anymore, she can just commandeer an apostle's body, given that it's her natural inferior anyway. But the fact that Slan is personally invading the Kushan Empire also tells us another thing. We're well and truly into the endgame of Berserk. For a long time, we've been wondering in which order the God Hand would be dealt with, if all of them would be dealt with in the first place. But now that Slan is practically offering herself up as the first sacrifice, it's only a matter of finding a way to make sure that happens. Luckily for the Kushan, they have all the magical help they'll ever need and the services of the greatest engineer in Berserk. Big Rick's Big Rig! How Rickert will become a key player in managing the troll invasion. In every video we've made about the recent chapters, we've speculated what Guts will do and how he might get involved in the war that's coming, but we don't want to do that in this video because he only appeared for a single frame in chapter 378. In that frame, he was sweating all over and he had regained the dazed look he had before he sensed Rakshas's presence with his brand of sacrifice. If we're right about Slan's arrival, maybe he'll get shocked into finally taking action when her presence makes his brand explode with pain, but even then, we'll have a major decision to make. Chapter 3 373 shows Guts getting taunted by his inner beast of darkness, and what it says to him is rather disturbing. The beast knows Guts craves power now that he lost Casca just after truly getting her back. It has tried convincing him to kill her, turn her into a sacrifice that keeps the flames of malice and vengeance burning in his heart forever. It told him he needs to become Griffith in order to beat Griffith, but Guts wasn't ready to do that before. He wanted to get Casca back to normal first and consider his options once that happened, but he couldn't even sit on it before she was taken 
taken from him again. Maybe he will stand up and fight to protect his loved ones like he always has when he realizes he has an opportunity to kill a god hand. Maybe he stays dazed and confused, craving power he knows he shouldn't use, and eventually gives in to the desire that the god hand controls. But those things are highly speculative and depend majorly on the kind of path Guts takes moving forward. For Rickert, that path is much clearer. He just wants to defeat Griffith and rid the world of his ilk once and for all. Rickert has been single-mindedly focused on getting himself prepared for the war with Falconia, to the point he thinks that even the Kurul tie from Chapter 377 was a bit premature. He's going to be the first line of technical defense against Falconia, given his expertise with engineering and smithing. And he's also going to be the man who revolutionized warfare for the world, because trust us when we say, this boy's got something cooking in the basement, and he isn't doing it with his high school chemistry teacher. The last time Rickert debuted an original creation, he killed an apostle with it, and this time he's got a much larger ground to play with. By his own admission, Rickert was never the strongest sword in the Falcons. He's much better at using tools to their maximum capacity like the rapid-fire crossbow or the medieval bazooka. Considering the fact that he's been preparing for war with Griffith for a few months now, we're sure he's cooked up some devices that we haven't even dared to imagine, and we might just get to see them debut in the next chapter. Rickert knows he isn't the best fighter, but his eyes look more determined than ever at the end of 378. We know that guy would rather fight than run away, considering his actions in Falconia, so yes, Big Rick will drop a big rig on these fools soon enough, and we wish we were talking about FTR's finisher, but alas, can't have everything your way, can ya? Marvelous Verdict! So that's it for this video. What happens in Chapter 379 is something we can only speculate on because if the current publishing pattern holds, we'll only get it next year. So for now, this is what we've got for you guys. Let us know what you think down in the comments, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more Berserk content. This is Wizard Wheezy signing off for now, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Till then, keep on struggling, strugglers.